everyone, and welcome to our new morning show. We don't have a name yet. We don't have a name yet. That was on you guys, and I'm pretty sure nobody suggested anything. We got but, a couple of oh, Okay, well then we're going to pick a name for it. But we are sorry for the last minuteness of our Facebook Live this morning, but we got a really convincing email from a high school student, Lexi, who wanted a quick video on weapons of the American Revolution. So this is a day where we're going to do your homework for you. Uh, but we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the guns that we have, and Danny, my assistant curator, hello, Danny, my assistant curator, is holding a gun that is not period correct for the American Revolution, but it's all we got in terms of educational firearms. Uh, this is actually a Harper's Ferry, so it's a little bit later time period, but we're going to be talking about the mechanism and the standard kind of configuration of muskets before we go into the muskets that were actually used during the American Revolution. So a standard firearm that you would see during the time of the American Revolution was a musket, which was typically a smooth bore gun, and it was also known as a muzzle loader. The muzzle means the end of the barrel, and so that's where you would load the gun. I should also point out that this is, is, is a reproduction, so we are going to be playing around with the mechanism a little bit more than we will on our historic guns, which you'll see here in a second. So with these muskets, they were smooth bore, and smooth bore essentially means that there was no rifling in it, and that wasn't a really big deal because the way that you used to fight in wars was kind of a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder configuration, and so accuracy was not necessarily required. Accuracy um, by volume. Yes, that. <laughs> and so you have a smooth bore gun, you have a round musket ball, and the way that you would load this would be you would put your powder, your wad, and your projectile down the barrel. And um, I gotta tell, say that this uh, ramrod's a little tight, so Danny's not just incredibly weak. Uh, and once you had all of your, your powder, your wad, your projectile down, you would put the ramrod down the barrel, make sure it's all impacted down at the breech of the gun, and then put your ramrod back. And then if we can bring it up to the action. This is a flint lock action, that was the common action during the American Revolution. And what that essentially means is it uses a piece of flint to spark a flame. So you would put powder in the pan right here, and you would lower this steel plate called a frizzin that would lock it into place. And then when you are ready to fire, when you've got everything loaded down the muzzle, you've got your powder in the pan, you are ready to press your trigger, and we're gonna make sure that, uh, and don't try this at home. This is unloaded and the breech is plugged, so. You get a spark. You notice you get a spark there, and that spark is what uh, will ignite the powder to go into a small hole here called the touch hole, which will hopefully fire the projectile, although early technology was not always an exact science. So the flintlock mechanism was the traditional style that you would see uh, until it's replaced in the 1800s. We can go in and I'll have our lovely camera lady pan down onto some of our historic artifacts here. We can talk about the two popular, two of the most popular muskets that you'll see in the American Revolution. And of course, the first one is the Brown Bess musket, and that was an English made firearm. And as you can see from the reproduction that we have versus the traditional one, it's a little bit longer. Typically, about 46 inch barrel on some of the standard muskets, Brown Bess muskets, but they were, they had lots of variances involved and the one that was the most popular during the American Revolution was the short land pattern which had a little bit shorter of a barrel but as you'll notice as we pan down the barrel that the stock stopped short about four inches from the muzzle this gun was about 75 caliber smooth bore flint lock just like we just talked about and it was one of the main contenders one of the ones you see most often when people talk about the American Revolution now if we pan down you'll see a firearm that is the French variant, and it's called the Charleville musket. And you'll notice it's a little bit shorter as we pan down it, and it's 69 caliber, so the caliber's a little bit smaller, but still rather large. And the Charleville was one of the preferred guns in the American Revolution, and the French arsenals were essentially trying to purge what they had, so they were making new guns, but they were also sending parts to the United States and broken parts so that people in, or not, sorry, not the United States, the colonies, do that every time. You said you were going to do that. I did say I was going to do that. The people in the colonies could uh, essentially make what they needed so that they had enough. 
that's always an interesting kind of conversation about how did the colonies get guns, and they pretty much did whatever they could. Uh, big borrow steel, manufacture their own, and the Charleville was one of their one of their favorites, and was actually the basis for the first U.S. standard military arm, the 1795. And so it's a, a really neat gun, but sometimes less talked about than the brown vest. But the, these two muskets, you could say, man, they look a lot alike, they're all smooth bore, they have large calibers, they're flint lock, they must not be very different. And the reality is that that's not correct. And the soldiers uh, during this time, they knew quality and they knew the differences in all the different variances of the brown besses, the Charlevilles, the different muskets that they were using, and so they had their own preferred and favorite gun. But I'm going to turn it over to Danny because we've talked about smoothbore guns. We've talked about guns that you can load three shots a minute, uh, their you know, accuracy by volume. But it's not to say that rifling was not around. And there were riflemen during the American Revolution. So I'm going to have Danny talk a little bit about that. So I don't know how close you can get to this example, but this is a classic American long rifle made by a gunsmith named uh, Christopher Hawken out of Hagerstown, Maryland, near where I am from. And this one is actually a little bit later than the Revolution. It's probably 1790s, but all of our period correct or time correct uh, rifles are actually on display at the moment. So this one was a little easier to get to, to talk about, and it's fairly similar to the guns, the rifles that would have been available during the American Revolution. Now, rifles in the Revolution, we like to think of our American heritage as being these expert marksmen ambushing the British, but that was rather the exception more than the rule. And um, most soldiers in the Continental Army would have had a musket. And as Ashley mentioned, the rifle, one of the biggest drawbacks for it at the time, even though it has much greater accuracy, it's much slower to load. And from three rounds a minute in a musket to something like maybe a round a minute in a rifle. And because uh, what the big reason for that is the to get that accuracy, the ball, the musket ball, or the rifle ball, has to fit uh, the grooves very tightly, and you patch that with uh, wadding, and it's you have to really force it down. It's a much longer process. Whereas in muskets, they often contributed to the accuracy problem by deliberately undersizing the ammunition and uh, to make it easier to load, to get that volume and rate of fire that to achieve accuracy. So the features of the long rifle at the time is this is a much smaller bore. Um, it'll put it close to there. You tell it's a little bit less in diameter, the barrel's a little bit less in diameter overall, but the bore is much smaller. These were typically in the 30 to 40 caliber range um, compared to the 69 or 75 caliber of the smoothbore muskets. It's also uh, much more slender. If you look at the wrist and the stock on a musket, you notice this is much narrower, much kind of more graceful lines, and it makes a really nice hunting piece, but um, it's not necessarily great for the durability of a military campaign. Another major drawback as far as military commanders are concerned is this has nowhere to attach a bayonet. Um, bayonet tactics of the day are very important, like this one that belongs to our brown vest, and um, commanders needed a way to attach these for their troops, uh, for things like charging home after a volley or protecting against and they needed to defend against cavalry or something like that. So bayonets are very. And also important. made a great candle holder. Also made a great candle holder and general utility tool for camp light. Um, but the rifle can't attach one. So riflemen often operated in kind of small numbers. There were specially designated companies for them, and uh, but they were never the predominant force. It was always more musket armed troops than rifle armed troops. And there were riflemen on both sides. It wasn't just American riflemen. The British did have some including the notable uh, Colonel Ferguson, I forget his rank now. Anyway, Ferguson, the commander in the British Army, had designed a breech-loading rifle uh, shortly before the war, and the British used a few of those, but um, not very many. So that's the rifle in the American Revolution, the short version. So we hope this helps uh, with your presentation, Lexi, and we're excited to have gotten an opportunity to go back live for the first time in 2017 
Hopefully we'll have a name of our show uh, in the coming weeks. And if you are enjoying these videos, make sure to check us at SHOT Show here in about a week and a half. We'll be showcasing some of our historic guns at SHOT Show and we'll be coming live several times in many modern manufacturers booths talking a little bit about their history. So make sure to check us out, comment, like us on Facebook, and if you didn't like us, that's okay too.